If you, anyone, sort of injected OCD into anyone's head, they would experience that. It's not a case question of weakness. I used to think it was weakness for years. I went to the gym harder and harder, six, seven times a week, thinking I've got to make myself stronger to get away from this. And then I used to beat myself up thinking, oh, you're such a wimp for, for thinking like this and not being able to hold this together and sort of over and over beating myself up. But it's got different angles it comes at people. When I became more accepting and realised, hey, why would it matter even if you were weaker? Why would that matter? It's not a, nowhere says that you have to to be strong all the time it then still came in from different angles that it will try anything it tries to take if you if there's a, just a little bit of doubt or anything that you think about yourself boom it's like that on steroids so i think that's really important to highlight because otherwise what happens is on this journey we've all been in we tend to think that i, I like we tend to think like oh it's it's my fault i how has this happened oh this is oh i sh other people don't think like this if anyone had that most likely genetic component of OCD, they'd feel exactly the way you do, right? I work with people that are very high up people in the military, uh, in SWAT teams, in the police, um, and they talk to me about OCD, maybe say like our OCD, which has always got an even negative image in the OCD community amongst men, which is like, well, how could you be worried about your wife or your girlfriend to that level? Like, come on, pull yourself together. But they don't understand the genetic component of how OCD operates, right? And those guys are in super dangerous situations. I'll speak to them and I've had this exact conversation. I've said, what have you been doing today in your job? And I know these people well on a one-to-one -one basis. And they're telling me some crazy story how they've been in a situation where they've been shot at and nearly killed that day. And I said, how was it? And they said, no anxiety about that whatsoever. I've been worried about this relationship OCD thing throughout the day. Now, just let's put that in perspective. His life's on the line. He's not worried about that. He's, he, that doesn't bother him. He's not actually anxious about that. Most people would be. But in his mind, he isn't. But he's worried about something relating to relationship OCD. Now, if you told people, oh, I have OCD, they don't understand it. Of course, they're going to make the mistake of, oh, that's just tidiness. Everyone's got it. But even if they do, people don't understand it. People in medical profession don't understand it. OCD specialists often, usually, not even often, don't understand it to the full extent. So you've got to think about it like if a person in that scenario is scared, it's obviously not how people think it is. OK, and it's certainly not to do with weakness and weakness is a funny thing because people will come in and say, like, you'll have, say, some 18 year old woman who's very shy in, in a lot of her life and she's kept away from all fears and she describes herself as uh, sort of weak, scared, uh, lets her family down, go and then do the hardest exposures, overcome everything has like lived with OCD for five or six years, dealing with it all herself, done all the work for recovery, um, like for, through reading and being proactive and doing everything herself and just become a completely, uh, really confident, still all her usual personality traits she wants to keep, but become really confident, overcoming everything, super brave with it. It's, it, it the way the world works is we label ourselves one thing, say, oh, I'm weak, I'm strong. I could put somebody that you think is really strong in a situation that's difficult, and then they will back out every time, right? So, and especially with exposures like that, especially with shame attacking exercises, people often say, and I used to say, I used to say, oh, I'm not scared of anyone's rejection or whatsoever. Uh, yeah, you try the Albert Ellis exercise of walking a banana down the street. Nobody likes that. OK, uh, so it's it's these things aren't like we think they are. It's the same as how nervous do people get about asking someone out. Right. People are hugely nervous about that. Most people don't want to go and speak to someone, even in a bar, even after a few drinks. Often they don't want to because they're so scared of the rejection of no. But as Albert Ellis said, when he went to the Bronx Botanical Gardens and he went and asked out 100 people, he got over that fear in a day. And uh, we've all had that. I used to have that one, uh, not be, not wanting to ask people out, um, out initially, thinking, oh, what if I got rejected? It was never a major problem for, in, 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 in my, my life, but it was a problem where uh, we all had that barrier. 99% of people have that barrier. But then I obviously did like Albert Ellis's book said and I went and spoke to people in the day and so on. And so it would make no difference to me asking someone out whether I was walking down the street or whatever, because there's no fear there and it makes no difference. And um, it, 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 those things, if you asked anyone, oh, just go and speak to that person in the street. 
they wouldn't like to do that. And they can start small. They could say like, pick someone who thinks really attractive on the street and go and ask them where the nearest Starbucks is. People don't even want to do that because they think, what if that person thinks I'm trying to chat them up? So they avoid that too. So we do everything to avoid all these situations for fear, this illusionary fear, like state that we think the whole world's going to, there'll be this impending doom on the spot if that were to happen and we got rejected. And it isn't. Actually getting rejected loads makes you realise that there's nothing to fear and then you grow more confident. Um, and I think all those things are so key. They are so key because people tend to write themselves off in, in one second or label themselves in one second or judge themselves in one second as a particular type of person. As a, that, that's the way they're going to be for the rest of their life. That's who they are. They box themselves in. They say, I'm this personality type. This is me. And that's me set for life. That ain't true at all. You can completely change your career, can change who you are uh, in terms of personalities, different features. You can do that. Life is change. Life is adaption. But we tend to box ourselves in. And that boxing, that constriction and that rigid black and white thinking is what leads to chronic anxiety and chronic guilt.